Sitting on top of this western sky, is it gonna be the one to take me far? We're on Boston Hill, which was the mining district of Silver City. It's a city park for hiking, and you see the old mining here, and it is, and the native vegetation is slowly reclaiming. This is Plains Lovegrass, or Ceteria macrostachia. Uh, it was a plant that was harvested, as you know, by the by the Sari Indian people, by the Piman peoples, uh, people in Mexico, across Western North America. The grain will be a little bit larger. It is not totally filled out, but they're the grain separated from the chaff gives millet as nutritious as wheat or any other grains. The majority of grasses, as I said, maybe almost all, are edible to humans, the grain, but some of the grains are very small and some have better qualities for harvesting and probably all are nutritionally significant. After all, our civilization is based on grains. This is a panic grass. It's a panicum. It's probably a small panicum bulbosum. But again, it's another one. It's a panic grass in his very interesting, useful. Inside each one is a grain. And they're not quite ripe. Home in on this. This is Tragus. Isn't that cool? Do you see the structures in there? I didn't think that this was a significant or interesting viable candidate as a modern agronomic crop, but look, you can see how you know, if you can see how dense it grows. And the Apaches say that this is one of our favorite grains. This is like a library library of specimens and uh, the green codes are Latin America and the pink codes are out of state and the yellow are Arizona and uh, here's one that's collected in 2009 and I'll bet if we look a little further uh, uh, here's one collected in 1987 here are some specimens Here's one collected in 1958, and this has all of the all of the diagnostic parts that one would need in order to identify the plant. In fact, if you look at these at these little uh, uh, at the ons, it's three ons. It has three of them. And look at these these little slender things at high at high magnification. They're beautiful. They have uh, they have sculptured uh, sides. And that's one of the ways that you can be sure, even if you have a fragment of this, of this little uh, on there. So is this part of a project you're working on, or what is the... Yes, this is the grasses, the gra uh, this is for a book on the work on the, on the grasses of the Sonoran Desert. And there's two closely related species of this little, this small grass. And the interesting thing about this is grasses of the Sonoran Desert. How many grasses are there really in the desert? Since deserts are usually thought to be without, without grasses or very low diversity of grasses. But it turns out that the Sonoran Desert is very rich in grasses. But as you go to the edge of the desert, where it's not as extreme, you pick up many, many more species. And once you go beyond the desert, either into the subtropics or up into the grass, real grasslands, you get many more species. And so it's a matter of how much diversity in, uh, versus, versus aridity. You know, these patterns are 
fairly interesting as far as the and as far as the evolution of uh, of grasses. And as you know, the nipa is uh, is one of the few grasses that's totally endemic to the Sonoran Desert. It's not found anywhere else. In fact, it's found only in the very center of the epicenter of the Sonoran Desert. And the only way that you can really figure these out is to really look at their private parts. Uh, grasses are really easy, but the parts are very small. And so that's what usually scares people. And they don't, uh, they think that grasses are difficult to work with. How many, give me an idea of how many grasses you've been working with here. Oh, Jim, how many do you think? Probably around 300. Yeah, I was going to say probably 250, 300. Yeah, between, yeah. Between 250 and 300, and probably the reason for that big, that big variation is that 20% are right along the edge of the desert. And it's what you consider desert and what you consider not desert, and that can occupy a lot of argument. So what kind of people will be using this? Well, uh, anybody interested in grasses, but the grasses are highly economic, they're very interesting scientifically and for, and for conservation. Interesting thing about, we're calling this uh, grasses of the Sonoran Desert, a flora on the move, because uh, there's no other major group of plants in a desert where there's been so much dynamic change uh, due to people and due to change over the past 40,000 years since we have records from from uh, collections made by ancient pack rats, and we can, as you know, we can look at the uh, pack rat mints, uh, take out the uh, take out the floral parts, and you can sometimes just identify them right down to species or subspecies or variety. So the herbarium seems to be your second home here. Well, that's one area where I do a lot of work. Our specialty is in southern Arizona native plants. We grow a lot of obscure, hard to find plants that other nurseries don't typically grow or see much horticultural value in. And we also specialize in wildlife plants too and pollinator plants. Uh, I would run into Felger when I would go to the University of Arizona Herbarium and my interest in grasses led me to Richard and Richard being a very busy man would always be at the herbarium desperately trying to get some research done while a lot of people including somebody like me would want to come up to him and ask him to identify specimens or ask him questions so I found the most successful place where I could actually talk to Richard for brief periods of time was when he was making a copy uh, at the Xerox machine and so I would approach him where I could get a good 45 seconds of uninterrupted uh, uh, time where I could throw in a question I actually went to a talk that he gave at the herbarium about NEPA, but and until I went to the talk, I really was not familiar with that particular grass. There's a, uh, a related species that's local to, or originally was local to the Tucson Basin when the Santa Cruz River was flowing, and I've been familiar with that grass, uh, Dysticlus uh, um, spicata, but um, I was not familiar with the Sonoran species. I think it has huge economic uh, value, and uh, especially with our changing climate, um, and the uh, um, changing ecology of soils around the world, I, I think that NEPA could be a, a very viable replacement for a lot of water-intensive uh, food crops. Here we have uh, NEPA, Dysticlus palmeri, and ironically both of these plants I obtained uh, through Richard. Um, this is a dioecious plant, meaning that it has male flowers born on one uh, plant and female flowers born on the other plant. This guy over here is a male plant and this is a female plant. So we will primarily be reproducing just the female plants. Um, and then if somebody needed uh, to actually produce the grain, they would need both of them. At this point, I'm not really sure if it would have any invasive potential in this area. It's not, it's a Sonoran native, but not necessarily native to Arizona. So Nipah has the largest seeds of any of our local grasses. Uh, all of, just about all of the grasses produce edible seeds, but typically they're very small seeds or seeds inside of sheaths and you have to, it takes a lot of work to actually get uh, a usable amount of food. Nipah having large grains 
almost rice-sized grains uh, makes it a, a viable food crop. The island is near the mouth of the Colorado River in the upper Gulf of California, so where the river meets the sea. And the island is basically formed by sediment carried by the river. No? See, this is sediment from the Rocky Mountains and the Grand Canyon. So this is the place where, where the river comes or used to come with, uh, with fresh water and nutrients and sediment. And so it creates a perfect habitat for Nipa. No? So, the, the salt grass can, can survive very well with seawater, but it germinates better and produces better grain when it has these pulse flows from the fresh water. We were trying to collect a group of individuals and organizations and form a coalition to start doing uh, very intensive research you know, to understand better the life history and the ecology and the nutrient dynamics of the salt grass of NIPA and understand better also the, the habitat it provides for key species like the, the breeding water birds and the large gulf savanna sparrow and we want to understand better how much nutrients it contributes to the upper gulf of california and also uh, for me it's very important to, to try to understand better what is the importance of the pulse flows for the production of grain uh, for, for salt grass and the relationship of river flows with the uh, extent of, of, of salt grass patches in the uh, mouth of the river and upper Gulf region. Then also we want to start working on developing uh, the information to, to see how NIPA can be used as a crop uh, with seawater no? to produce food. I agree completely with, with Richard's statement that uh, NIPA is probably the second most important contribution of, of Mexico to the world, not just after corn because of its potential as a, as a food crop that can grow with seawater. For the Tojono Otam and for the Cucapa too, this region of the upper Gulf of California, Colorado River Delta and Gran Desierto, uh, this is the center of the universe. And I agree. Tide coming in? Sure. Now? Yes. The first one, make sure I got the number correct. Number three, site one, number three. Okay. These being grasses, they are they are wind pollinated. As you noticed yesterday, there's plenty of wind there. You can actually see the salt. Even though the plant grows in seawater, it, it, uh, the plant excretes seawater and the grain is not salty at all. They're sweet when, when, when they're young and then as soon as they mature, they become dry and hard, just like, uh, just like any of our common uh, grains such as wheat, rice, and so forth. I first met Richard Felger when he had just published his Seri book and uh, he was working at the Desert Museum at the time I believe and came and talked to a group of what are called Westerners and uh, Richard came and talked to us and I bought a signed copy of his Seriland book 
and it was wonderful. I read it from cover to cover, and uh, it just opened so many vistas about people, their relationship with the sea and the land, and also with plants. You know, Richard is uh, really going to be remembered as one of our foremost ethnobiologists, ethnobotanists of all time. And um, I, I think what really came through in both his, his talk at that time and in the book was his enor enormous love of the people and the place and uh, the things. And he was curious about the sea turtles and he was curious about the bighorn sheep and the plants and the cactus. And, and uh, he seemed to know everybody in the village by name too. It was just, just wonderful to meet somebody with that enthusiasm. Richard Felger walked into the back door of our little whitewashed adobe house in Desemboki, and as my mother tells it, he walked in and the first words out of his mouth were, where can I press my plants? <laughs> he, had a, he was quite singular minded back then, and he probably had bags full of plants that were ready to wilt, and there was one thing on his mind that that was to press his plants, and my mother was quite taken aback and sort of uh, a little bit, who is this fellow who <laughs> walks in my house and wants to press his plants, that's the first thing he says. Richard was, included me on his trips into the desert to collect plants. So my mother and maybe a couple Sari women would be riding along and I'd get to sit way in the back of his uh, little white Toyota, or whatever it was, sitting on the wheel well, well bouncing along. Uh, what was fun in collecting plants, something I'd never done, I was always interested in finding a plant that he didn't know as a, as a child. So I'd walk around and, and look for something and never did. I never did. He always disappointed me. I always hoped he'd get excited and jump, but it didn't work. The Sonoran Desert is a magnificent place, and like any place on the planet, it faces challenges. Uh, we certainly have a uh, changing climate at the moment. We have many more millions of people moving into the Sonoran Desert. But I think the real challenge for the Sonoran Desert is for people to learn to embrace the desert and see it as part of their lives. But we need to l realize that we're part of an ecosystem. We, the humans, are part of this great grand world that we call the Sonoran Desert. And we have to learn to live with it, not against it, but with it. And I think that is the largest challenge for conservation and for our own preservation. These are Apache redgrass and big sacatone for farming and for replanting uh, in Silver City and anyone who wants them, but mostly these will be for planting at Honey Hop Farm. We're only going to discuss Big Sacatone, which is a kind of a funny name, because Sacatone in Spanish means large grass or large grass area. It's kind of like the signs you see west of Tucson for Table Mesa. So I'm starting grasses in these. That's yeah, that's great. I like that, Richard. Uh -huh. And then you can ride on them. Yeah. The grasses can come right up. Yeah, I just did that for the winter because they're in pots and I had to leave We're them outside. We're still going to get, what's in here, anything? Uh, there's a ton of comfrey in there I just threw in there because I harvested a bunch. Oh, so, so that has comfrey roots and yeah. seeds? Yeah. yeah, I just did that. That whole row of sacatone will be filled in with sacatone. So what do you think about grasses at this point? I think it's a really sustainable food source. Um, it's a perennial. It doesn't need overwatering uh, or extra water once it's established. Um, harvest standing up, not bending down. I mean, 
it doesn't need to be sprayed. There's uh, so many reasons it's here. It's fitting the crop to the land. So I think it's a, a really viable food crop. Richard's work is enormously important. His publications, his books, for example, on the Seri, they bring together a larger sweep of, of cross-cultural, interdisciplinary information about plants. And he loves to understand the relationship between a, a climate and a landscape and the people, the plants, the animals. And uh, his books are enormously important for the region um, that, that he has, has worked in. But also along the way, he has encouraged a number of people to do their own research, to make their own observations. 